Welcome to season two of Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, the body. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I've found that things aren't just black or white, or as simple as yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I will be sharing my own process through personal stories, interviews, and hopefully stories from listeners in an effort to help lessen the stigma and shame of disordered eating, eating disorders, and body image. If you'd like to share your story of ED recovery on this podcast, anonymous or otherwise, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we begin. The topic of disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and other behavior related to the body may not be difficult for me to share anymore, but it wasn't always this way. I recognize and anticipate the possibility of judgment or disbelief about my experiences, ranging from my own family members to strangers, in addition to the potentiality of losing certain opportunities for publicizing my own experiences. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as suggestion or advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Welcome, everyone. I loved doing season one of Grey Maybe so much that I decided to continue with a second season and a new topic. In the vein of Grey Maybe's original mission, this topic is also one worthy of freedom from shame and stigma. I have been a professional dancer for the last 20 years and started formal dance classes at the age of seven. I have known so many dancers over the course of my childhood, training, and professional career. According to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, ANAD, statistically, eating disorders affect 9% of the population. Of that statistic, less than 6% of people suffering are medically diagnosed as underweight. When it comes to dancers, the statistics are even more grim. Dancers have a three times higher risk of suffering eating disorders. Statistically for dancers, more than one in two female dancers and one in three male dancers do not meet their energy needs. The amount of people that are suffering from eating disorders, disordered eating, body obsession, dysmorphia, and the amount of people that are out about it or telling their stories simply is not adding up. I know way too many people to not know more people who have eating disorders. In fact, I know more people who have confided in me in their abortions than have admitted to me they have or continue to struggle with any kind of eating disorder. It took me a very long time to acknowledge I had a problem. The entire time, I maintained a fairly normal weight and lied about my behavior. I lied to myself and to others. I was afraid of the label and words that accompanied eating disorder, felt like a dirty word or a disgusting habit. It was something only other people struggled with. Early in my recovery, I guarded my eating disorder secret with more intensity than most other things in my life. I was terrified of anyone in my profession finding out. Why was that? No one was talking. Maybe because no one else was talking. So, I'll start. I have an eating disorder. I've had one for so long, I can't remember not having it. I don't remember what my first diet was or when, so I'll start at the beginning. Here's my eating disorder story. Trigger warning, eating disorders, disordered eating, bulimia, anorexia, fat phobia, suicide, depression, weight loss and gain, body dysmorphia. (music) 
according to my father, there were kids and then there were kids that were chunky. There were women and there were fat women. My father never skipped an opportunity to point out what was unacceptable to him. He freely commented on other people's looks, categorizing, especially if he didn't like them. And often it seemed like my dad didn't like a whole lot of people. It seemed like almost everyone had something wrong with them, and he knew exactly what it was. In the 80s, describing kids as chunky was said so much around me it seemed normal. My eyes were brown, I was short, and that kid over there, according to adults, was chunky. It became very clear that women who were quote-unquote fat were especially offensive to my father. For some reason, they had done something offensive that I wasn't aware of. My mother was quieter about it, outwardly compassionate, but there still seemed to be a hint of something, almost like personal failure around being larger bodied. No one in my immediate family was quote unquote chunky. Everyone probably fell into the small framed or thin category. My father worked during the summers all day outside on his lawn maintenance business. He drank coffee in the morning and sodas all day, and then would eat one giant meal at night. One night, we had gone to Old Country Buffet as a family. At the head of a very long line of hungry families, I watched my dad start to write a check, then stop to wipe his forehead. My mom said, her voice urgent, are you all right? He nodded and continued, and as he started to sign his name at the bottom of the check, my dad fell like dead weight to the ground. I thought he had died, and I started scream crying in panic. My mom shushed and shunned me while she tried to pick him up by his arm. The paramedics were called. They checked him out and said he was fine. They chalked it up to low blood sugar. We ate at the restaurant after like nothing had happened. I felt like I was going to puke. My nervous system completely dysregulated and filled with shame over my ridiculous outburst. Everyone was still staring at us. I could feel their eyes. Some of the patrons tried to make themselves and us less uncomfortable by making little jokes about what had happened. We smiled gratefully for their attempted kindness cloaked in humor. I couldn't wait to leave. My mother, naturally slim, often mentioned how people complimented her physique with a mix of pride and contempt. It was the most consistent type of praise I'd heard her share. She would announce the compliment, seeming genuinely pleased with herself. At times, it was met with its counterpart of contempt, because after all, if you were as busy and stressed out as her, you wouldn't have time to sit around and eat all day either. And you certainly wouldn't just let yourself eat whatever and whenever you wanted. That's how she didn't gain too much weight when she was pregnant with me. As well as the very important fact that after birthing me, she was back in her pre-pregnancy genes a week later. These were coveted facts, things my mother was very proud of. At least that's what it seemed like to me. Both of my parents had full-time jobs. When I wasn't at school or after school type daycare programs, I had a very cool teenage babysitter. I thought the world of her. She wore the coolest clothes, had all the coolest phrases, and she always dotted her I's and J's with little circles instead of dots. It was so cool. She had cool hair and, to me, a body I wanted when I was a teenager. One day on a walk together, she mentioned how she was developing thunder thighs and that it meant her thighs were getting big. I thought she was making some sort of joke because I didn't see what she did. I certainly didn't ever think there was anything wrong with her thighs, nor did they constitute this thunder thigh diagnosis. She mentioned they shook when she walked and she made fun of them as we speed walked to my house. In that moment, I remember thinking that this was very serious. An older girl, who I thought was the epitome of cool, was very concerned about this part of her body. If she was concerned, it must be pretty important. I took note. This was something I needed to keep an eye on, something I needed to get a hold of early, be vigilant of, before it got out of control. I watched a lot of TV growing up. My favorite Disney cartoon was The Little Mermaid. There was Ariel, and then there was her evil counterpart, Ursula. The song Part of Your World was a song I sang incessantly. It's not lost on me now, how I've spent very much of my adult life, yearning to be a part of worlds I have never felt like I fit into. In addition, relating to a protagonist who sold her voice for the love of a man or perceived freedom. I noticed all of the Disney princesses had an identical body. It was the same body that all of my Barbies had. The culture of the 80s didn't disappoint when it came to what was modeled as attractive. Thin, but with big boobs, small waist, tall-ish, and thin long legs. 
This was magnified in the 1990s when heroin chic and its poster girl, Kate Moss, a popular supermodel, was coined as the poster child of a subcategory of waif models. She was served up to my starving self-confidence as the epitome of glamour, femininity, and attractiveness. In an article I once read about the famous waif, she had been quoted as saying, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. I didn't know how skinny felt, but I knew I agreed with her. I knew that discipline was something I wanted more of, and when I didn't have it, I felt like a moral failure. The adult relationships I saw in the media I was consuming followed a consistent prototype. Skinny wife, fat husband. The Simpsons, Family Guy, King of Queens, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Family Matters, according to Jim, The Flintstones. Even shows where the characters weren't human, like the well-known show Dinosaurs, with its infamous phase, Not the Mama, redundantly yelled by the show's baby dinosaur. The TV series aired from 1991 to 1994, and reflected the skinny wife, fat husband dynamic. The single woman empowerment era of shows were just beginning to transform the market in the late 90s, and although revolutionary for the time, they often didn't pass the Bechtel test, and it seemed only very thin women were allowed to be empowered single women. See Allie McBeal and leads in Sex and the City, but very specifically the character Carrie. My mom had enrolled me in a community dance program at the age of seven or eight. It was held in the gymnasium and there were no mirrors. My teachers were impressed with my ability and they recommended I started taking more formal dance classes at a professional studio. My mom followed their recommendation and soon I was dancing in dance competitions and spending many hours a week with my reflection. It wasn't until around 12 that my relationship changed with the mirror. No longer was it a tool to help me learn dance steps, but a tool to help me monitor and compare. I had moved to a new studio and the other dancers were all phenoms. I was at the bottom level of the class, and I had started to go through puberty before them. They also all knew each other, and with the exception of one or two in the class, it was the first time I'd felt left out and kept out. I cursed my developing body and pined after their still childlike physiques. Later, in adulthood, a therapist would ask, how was dinner time growing up? Fine, I answered, normal. She followed up with, did you eat together? Yes. At the dining room table, mostly. Mostly, just dinner. And did you talk together, or what kind of conversation, if any, did you have? Pause. Did we have conversation? Maybe. What did we talk about? I couldn't remember, because all that I could recall in my mind was my dad berating, raging at my brother and me for fighting at the dinner table. It seemed like it happened every single night. We'd sit down, and it wouldn't be long before my brother and I would piss off my dad. He would call us horrible names, say terrible things, threaten us, slam his silverware down or his milk glass, and stomp out of the dining room, through the kitchen, down the stairs, followed by the familiar sound of the garage door slamming. I remember crying often from the verbal lashing. My mom, irritated by the entire exchange, would sternly say, Eat! How could I eat with my stomach aching from fear and sadness? How could I eat while sobbing? It made me choke. Eventually, I came up with a plan. No matter what my dad said to me, I wouldn't give him the satisfaction of my tears. I held the lump in my throat with brute strength, sat silent and stoic, pretended to turn to stone. I would hold it in and release it in the privacy of my own room, if at all. My father was the only one who was allowed to express rage in my household. My brother and I turned that rage on each other, often with violent fights. The rage that was inside of me compounded. It was trapped, and it bubbled under the surface like lava. I felt like the Hulk, but unlike the Hulk, I never got to fully unleash my rage. When I think back to when it all began for me, it all starts here. The low-level noise in the background, cueing and directing, impressionable me. I was taking notes. I knew what I wanted to look like, because I was being shown it day in and day out on TV, in the glamour magazines I coveted, and how the adults talked and behaved around me. I didn't know how to regulate my emotions or process my feelings. No one around me did either. Long before I was aware of my own body and the potential for my body to betray my desires and wishes, I knew exactly how I wanted to look, and I was fairly confident I would look how I wanted. I too would enjoy the slim physique of my mother and the effortlessness that went with it. But at the age 12, my body started to change. 
Although I was entering puberty sooner than my dance friends, at school I was shorter than all of my friends and the last to get my period or breasts. I desperately wanted breasts and to be like my friends who had their periods. I also hated being so short because I thought people thought I was a child and treated me like one. Soon after I got my period, my hips began to widen and my thighs were no longer the skinny little kid legs I was used to. The obsession commenced. I absolutely did not want to get thunder thighs. Staring at any mirror or reflection from all angles in my clothes and out, it began. What I wanted to be and what I saw wasn't lining up. I had a bubble butt and strong thighs from dance and figure skating. Clothes weren't fitting me like they fit my mom. No matter how much my mom tried to deniably say we had the same body type, long legs, short torso, it was becoming very clear to me that we didn't at all have the same body type. I spent so much time alone in my room trying to strategize what I would do, what I could do, exercise more, eat less, or only eat certain things, skip meals. I pinched at my skin, pulled muscle away, and read article after article in Seventeen, T Magazine, and Cosmo. I had to get this under control. The more insecure I felt at school, the more I needed this to work. When I would finally allow myself to eat and satiate my hunger, I felt defeated. Like a shitty coach, I berated myself for the loss and recommitted myself to doing better again the next day, only to repeat the pattern. On the outside, I wore cute clothing and I strutted down the halls of my junior high with a false confidence I had carefully manufactured to cover up the overwhelming and crushing insecurity. I felt like a fraud, but was shocked when friends and acquaintances remarked at how confident I was and how much they wanted to be confident too. Was this how confidence felt? If so, it felt terrible. I was completely preoccupied with what people thought about me, or rather, what they thought about how I looked. I got up early to put on makeup and do my hair. I often had a hard time deciding what to wear. My brain was a war zone of indecisiveness. I was hyper-aware of being watched or perceived every minute I wasn't alone. Walking in the hallways, sitting at my desk, walking with my tray in the lunchroom, eating in front of people, socializing with my friends, drinking water at the water fountain, waiting for a bus, getting on the bus, sitting on the bus, getting off the bus. My obsessions were fueled by diet culture, ads for popular foods like snack wells and Diet Coke, Weight Watchers shakes that you were supposed to use as a meal replacement. I was convinced I just had to find the right product or the right body part targeting exercise or meal skipping program to attain what I wanted. Then I would be good. I would be beautiful. I would be enough. Until then, it was my full-time job to figure it out, and I spent every moment doing just that. At the time, to me, male attention was a barometer of how acceptable I was. Although I was only 12, nearing 13, it was when I started to notice grown men staring, then averting their eyes quickly when I noticed. It felt like something. I couldn't put my finger on it. Was it power? Was it attention? Was it acceptance? And although I didn't know, I thought it was confusing. My need for acceptance from men and boys was all-consuming, as I strived to attain my idea of a perfect body. I was not only battling controlling my body, but I was battling my mother for control. I wasn't allowed to talk to, have boys as friends, or have any contact with boys outside of school. I wasn't allowed to wear what I wanted and struggled to have any privacy. My mother's control only fueled my desires and I became an excellent deceiver. I was constantly lying and withholding truths. Nothing she did dissuaded me from getting my needs met. Attention from boys was one of my drugs of choice, and I was a junkie. I would contort myself to fit a perfection that I saw, or whatever I presumed the crush I had desired. Like a detective, I was compiling evidence of what they liked and curating myself to fit it. Anything I was unsure of, I filled in the blanks with my own self-doubt and media consumption. I was 13 when I realized that suicide was an option. I didn't know what I felt, except it felt bigger than me, unrelenting, ever-present. I couldn't explain why I felt this way, why everything hurt so much. It felt like an undercurrent of sadness, an invisible force in the river of my life. When my feelings were hurt or I was inevitably let down, It felt like death, traumatic. I blamed my physicality. I vowed to give myself a makeover. 
I'd punish myself, for it must have been what had caused the rejection. My inability to deal with any kind of rejection, dubbed more recently as rejection sensitivity, played such a deafening role in my dysfunction, as did my inability to understand, identify, or process my feelings. I suffered depression and anxiety, mostly alone, with the exception of seeing a therapist my mom had found because she had quite literally hit rock bottom in the battle of dealing with me and my silent treatment towards her. I figured, if I wasn't going to be heard or listened to, I might as well be mute, and I stuffed it all down and said what I wanted in my head. For a brief moment, things got a little better for me. I was allowed to have guy friends, and I was able to lean on my friends and feel less isolated. However, my behavior was still my bestest friend when it came to dealing with discomfort. In junior year in high school, following a fight with a boyfriend, I recall excusing myself from science class to try and throw up lunch. I was not successful. Logically, I knew what that behavior was. I knew the word for it. But I didn't think it applied to me. I just needed the relief I thought I would feel if I could do it. Because it didn't work, I never tried again. I stuck with the hypervigilance, the obsession, the restriction, the endless diet and exercise research, the self-deprecation, and the full-time job of trying to look acceptable. I don't think anyone suspected I had an eating disorder or that I spent all of my time managing this obsession. I portrayed myself as very normal, or maybe no one really paid enough attention to notice. I ate when people were supposed to eat. I was a normal body weight for my height and age. I was very active on top of that. I never lost an amount of weight that anyone thought something was wrong with me. I also didn't think that what I was doing, what I was thinking, and my obsession was a problem or qualified as an eating disorder. I didn't think I had body dysmorphia. No one knew what was in my head, and I liked it this way, mostly because I had found a way to cope. My eating disorder became my best friend. It was always there for me when no one else was, and it was always offering a solution. I originally wanted to entitle this story my first diet, but I couldn't remember when that was. Over space and time, there have been too many to count. Trying to think back has highlighted how difficult it has been to remember the last time I recall not hating my body. In revisiting my early ED behavior, I'm reminded how much space and energy it took up for me, how alone I felt, and how it set me up for the next 20 years before I got help and gained much-needed recovery. Tune in next week for part two of my eating disorder. If you're listening to this episode and you're realizing that you're more like me than not, welcome, and I hope this helps you take a step in the direction of recovery if you haven't already, and you're not alone. Just a reminder for anyone who needs to hear it, you don't need to wait until you're sick enough to get help. In fact, you don't have to be sick at all, just a desire to feel a little better. If you're listening and right now you're struggling with an ED, disordered eating, or other behaviors, welcome. Know that whatever you're feeling, there are those among us that have probably felt it too. You're not alone. If you're listening because you have someone you love in your life that is suffering or is in recovery for an ED, welcome. You are also not alone. Even having an eating disorder myself, I have not reacted the best I could to others who were struggling before my own recovery. Here are some do's and don'ts of how to deal with someone suffering. I'll attach a link to pull them up in the show notes, as well as links for the stats I mentioned at the beginning of the episode and various links for help when and if you're ready. Do's and don'ts for someone suffering with an eating disorder. Do realize there is not a quick and easy solution. Do talk to the person about your concerns, ask questions, and listen. Do express your feelings honestly with the person. They sense how you're feeling anyway. Do let the person know the qualities and characteristics other than physical that you appreciate about them. Do plan social activities that do not involve food. Do empower the individual to make their own decisions and be accountable for those decisions. Do allow the person to be in charge of their daily routines, realizing that by giving up control, you are setting the stage for the person to develop healthy self-control. Do encourage the person to get professional assessment from a practitioner experienced in treating eating disorders. Do realize the person may be ambivalent about getting well, 
and takes comfort and feels safe in the control and rituals of the disorder. Do express that you care and are interested in seeing the person get well. Do inform yourself about eating disorders and the treatment options. Attend support groups and read current literature. Don'ts. Don't ever give up. This is a long-term illness and people recover every day. Don't ignore the problem hoping it will go away. Talk about it. Don't panic. Seek the support you need. Don't assume there isn't a problem if the individual doesn't show physical symptoms. Don't force the person to eat or tell them to just eat. Don't make your love a condition of the individual's appearance, health, weight, achievements, or other attribute. Don't comment positively or negatively on an individual's appearance or weight. Don't feel you must walk on eggshells so that the person with the eating disorder won't be upset. Don't let the eating disorder disrupt family routines. Don't be manipulative. Be direct with your feelings and experiences. Don't try to control the person's behavior as this can intensify the problem. Don't impose rules except those that are necessary for the individual's family's safety and well-being. Avoid power struggles. Don't blame yourself, feel guilty, or dwell on the causes of the individual's eating disorder. Don't tell the anorexic who has gained weight they look better. Don't expect yourself to be the perfect parent, family member, or friend. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, this is also a social experiment to see if in telling my story, I can embolden listeners to share their stories. If you'd like me to read your recovery story on this topic, anonymous or otherwise, on the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com, G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. If you'd like to support this podcast, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now.